Good morning. Today on Spotlight, an in-depth conversation with CNN Global Affairs Analyst Aaron David Miller. He was in town recently thanks to the Jewish Community Relations Council and AJC. With so many different hot spots around the world, what insight can this historian, negotiator, and former advisor to six Republican and Democratic Secretaries of State give us? Mr. Miller spent two decades working inside the U.S. State Department and is now the Vice President for New Initiatives at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. He also holds a Ph.D. from the University of Michigan. And later, at our downtown studio, I'll check in with Megan Owens. She's Executive Director of Transportation Riders United. It's Sunday, November the 19th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Uh, fill in the blank for me. The Middle East is... An angry, dysfunctional, and broken place in which the United States is stuck. I used to be a lot taller before I started this job. <laughs> and having worked for half a dozen secretaries of state, primarily on uh, Arab-Israeli negotiations, but also advising on U.S. Middle East policy. Uh, I've come to a, some pretty sober conclusions about what we can do and what we can't uh, in this region. Such as? Well, you know, I start from the premise. I was a Michael Jackson fan, and uh, he's cool. I got one of his better songs, Man in the Mirror. Uh -huh. He said, you want to make a change in your life? The place to start is by looking in the mirror. And the problem, major problem in this region, is the absence of local ownership. You want an Israeli-Palestinian agreement? You can have one as long as you have Israeli and Palestinian leaders who understand what is required to do it. You want a stable Syria or a stable Iraq? You need leaders who are prepared to rise above their narrow sectarian, partisan, corporatist affiliations and think about the interests of the nation as a whole. So what's missing in this region are leaders who are willing to lead and institutions that reflect uh, the authority and legitimacy of, of most of the public. And that's going to be tough to find. And why is this leadership seem so inept, so to speak? Those aren't your words, those are my words. Uh, I mean, you know, leaders in this region are largely authoritarians. Uh, the Middle East, unlike Africa, Latin America, or any other part of the world, lacks a single, in the Arab world, lacks a single functioning democracy. Now, Israel is a, is a democracy. The Israelis are burdened, uh, however, with their own special and unique problems. So. In a, in a region where tribal, religious, sectarian affiliations have long dominated uh, how people identify themselves, particularly during times of conflict, mm -hmm. when central authority breaks down, people revert to their family, the militias, their respective tribes, their religions as a core form of uh, identification. Now here, you could argue that we're also becoming more tribal uh, we've got a blue and red thing going on here, which is about as bad as uh, I, I've seen in, in a long time. But you have here a set of institutions which, however are imperfect, a free press, a Congress, a judiciary, an executive branch, they compete with one another, but they're still viewed as legitimate. And people are willing, to a large degree, to work within these parameters. That really doesn't exist in, in this region. It's complicated. Um. Is the United States in a position with its current leadership to broker any kind of Middle East peace? I think that the odds of that happening are slim to none. I mean, I was at president at the last effort to do this, which was July of 2000. That's 17 years already under Bill Clinton, in which he brought Yasser Arafat and Ehud Barak to a summit, Camp David, presidential retreat in the Catoctin Mountains in Maryland for 12 days to try to get an agreement. That was the last, in my judgment, serious effort. And the gaps between Israelis and Palestinians on the big issues, Jerusalem, border, security, refugees, they're Grand Canyon-like. And I don't care how talented the president, any president is as a negotiator or a secretary of state. If, you, if the gaps are so large that they can't be narrowed and the parties themselves are unwilling to close them, all the U.S. can do is manage and uh, that's essentially the, the challenge that we face today. You've seen several uh, U.S. Secretary of States up close. Um, your view of Secretary Tillerson. Yeah, I work for six. George Shultz, 
to Colin Powell. Then I left the State Department in 03. The best negotiator are those six, without a doubt. And I respect them all. I don't want to offend or insult any of them. Mm -hmm. it was James Baker. Because Baker had something that Rex Tillerson does not have. Yeah, what was so good about Baker? Baker had a relationship, close personal relationship with Bush 41. And if the president doesn't have the back of a secretary of state in Washington and in the world, it takes about five seconds for our adversaries and our allies to figure out that the secretary doesn't speak for the president. And in this case, let's be very clear, this president has, hasn't even gone through the motions of empowering this particular secretary of state. So Tillerson's, made his, Tillerson's made his own situation worse, I think, but in the end, what Rex Tillerson suffers from is not an absence of stature, not an absence of negotiating skills, not an absence of the knowledge of the world. After all, he ran Exxon, and Exxon is basically a, it's a country. Mm -hmm. It's not just a company. I mean, it's big and it's knowledgeable. But without that empowering, without Donald Trump saying, this is my guy, he speaks for me, so you're saying loyalty is very, very important. Well, it's and and granted, uh, President Trump has been criticized by many in the press and other places because they say he has no loyalty. But those who are supportive of him like the fact that he's unpredictable and that um, that you aren't sure what he's going to do from day to day, and they feel that's his strength. Well, unpredictability can be a quality if it's deployed in the service of a predictable um, set of solutions. If you, you know what they say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a, a serious problem in this administration. Again, I voted for Republicans and Democrats. I work for Republicans and Democrats. This is not a partisan comment. This is an observation. This is the most idiosyncratic, strangest bureaucratic environment in the modern period in American history. Secretary of State is basically flanked by any number of people who speak on any number of issues. You have Nikki Haley at the UN, you have Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law who's handling the Arab-Israeli issue, you have Gary Cohn following climate change. It's hard to run the railroad like that, particularly on foreign policy, because your allies don't know who's actually calling the shots, nor do they have a point of contact. So. I'm hoping, this is almost a year in, I'm hoping that things will will change, but uh, I'm not so sure. Do you think that Secretary Tillerson serves out the entire term with President Trump? Yeah, it's hard to say. At this rate, uh, the way things are going now, it's hard to see why, having been disempowered, uh, he'd really want to stay. But this is the second best job in government. And it's an honor to serve. And I know that Rex Tillerson feels that it's an honor to serve. But he's got, the president has to allow him to do his job and to help him do his job. And we haven't seen that much. All right. We need to take a little break. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, some of the other key leaders on the world stage. We'll be right back. Stay with us. negotiation. How important is that word or is it important these days when you talk about relationships between countries, especially in difficult situations when we have ISIS and all sorts of other things? I mean, if you got a problem, you can look at it in several different ways. You could apply military pressure to see if you can resolve it. Or you could try diplomacy, what I call the talking cure. Or you could threaten military action but not undertake it in order to advance diplomacy. And I think the United States has to be extremely careful and very deliberate about how it assesses these particular instruments. Military power, the way we wield it, is formidable. There's no question. And the military does what it is asked to do. Let's take North Korea, for example, okay. which is at the top of the pile in right. terms of its urgency and immediacy. Okay, you got this guy, Kim Jong-un. Grandfather and father have all wanted nuclear weapons. Why? Because North Korea believes that the only way it can preserve the regime is defense. 
exactly, is to make it unmistakably clear to adversaries that we have nukes and we're prepared to use them. That's a, that's a stretch. I mean, using nuclear weapons is not so easy. It's only been done once. It was done by us. It's, be, it, it's been done to conclude a war. They've never been used again. So Kim Jong-un has these weapons. Roughly by 2020, they say he'll have, he'll have half the nuclear arsenal that the Brits have right now. So the question for the United States is, what do you do? We have no military option we could use. If we strike North Korea, the North Korean retaliatory capacity against Seoul, which is, I don't know, as close to uh, those rockets as, to, as, we, as we are to Detroit or Ann Arbor, is going to lead to an escalation on the Korean Peninsula that's going to kill thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. And Kim has biological weapons and chemical weapons. So what do you do? If you can't use military force, and I would argue, unless we are attacked, or unless there is an imminent threat of attack, and we have to preempt, we have no military option. The problem now is Kim's not interested in talking. Kim wants to perfect an ICBM capable of hitting the United States. Then he may come to the table to negotiate the best terms that he can. So we're really struggling on this one. If the Chinese wanted to, which they don't, and I'll tell you why in a minute, they could apply severe pressure on the regime. But the Chinese are more afraid of instability in North Korea than they are of Kim Jong-un's nuclear weapons. Because instability means that the US and the South Koreans would capitalize that on it. They could unite the Korean Peninsula. I mean, China doesn't want South Korea or a united Korea or the Americans on its doorstep. And if Kim falls, that's precisely what's so. Bottom line, the Chinese cannot fix this problem. That's what makes it so such an inc incredibly difficult thing to, to resolve. Um, let's turn our attention for a second to Israel, Netanyahu, uh, United States, and President Trump. How do you see their relationship, and is it a, is it a stronger relationship than? what we had when President Obama was in office. You know, I predicted... Because he one, was criticized um, several was, times by, by a lot of right. I mean, leaders look, in Israel. You, you had, there is not a relationship between an Israeli prime minister and an American president that is tension-free, with a possible exception, possible exception, of Bill Clinton's relationship with uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Rabin. Mm -hmm. I mean, Clinton writes in his memoirs that he loved Rabin as he had loved no man. That was an extraordinary, extraordinary statement by a U.S. president. And Rabin was an extraordinary leader. But by and large, all of the U.S. presidents I've worked for have wrestled with Israeli prime ministers. Every one. Shamir and Bush 41, Bush 43 and Sharon, Obama and Netanyahu. Even Clinton and Netanyahu in, in Netanyahu's first term. So you're going to have differences between the U.S. and Israel because we live on different planets. We are surrounded by non-predatory neighbors to our north and south, the Canadians and the Mexicans, and fish to our east and west, what one historian brilliantly described as our liquid assets. These two oceans, these liquid assets, yeah. they afford us a measure of security that is unparalleled in the history of international relations. The Israelis live on the knife's edge. I had two Israeli prime ministers, Rabin and Netanyahu, say the same thing to me. Don't preach to me about Israel's security. You live in Chevy Chase, Maryland. We're, live, we're sitting on top of a, of a volcano. So you're going to have differences. And anyone who expects the U.S.-Israeli relationship to be seamlessly smooth isn't thinking clearly. Trump. I would argue he's overdone it, but Trump made a determination that he's going to roll back every single one of Barack Obama's policies. And on this one, he was going to fix his relationship with Benjamin Netanyahu. He visited Israel earlier than any American president has ever done in its term. He was the first American president to pray at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. So. Trump made a determined effort to improve the relationship. Now, whether or not he gets the mileage out of it that he seeks, that he can convince Mr. Netanyahu to do a deal 
with the Palestinians is another matter. I'm not entirely persuaded of that. But there's no doubt there's been a fundamental improvement in this relationship. Russia, Syria, Assad. You know, I don't understand Mr. Trump's view of the Russians. He seems to accord Vladimir Putin a degree of protection and protected space that, in my judgment, isn't war warranted or justified. Um, he still believes he could somehow find a way to work out a deal with uh, Moscow on Ukraine, on Crimea, on Syria. I don't see the, I, I don't see any of that happening. Putin has his own interests, his own agenda, and to a large degree he's playing us like a finely tuned violin. What's the bigger danger to the world right now? ISIS or lone wolf terrorism? I don't, you know, to me, you have 90, you have 94 more now, Americans killed in terror attacks by jihadist groups since 9-11. All of those deaths have been caused by individuals who are either permanent legal residents of the United States or U.S. citizens. There has not been a single successful terror attack since 9-11 directed, controlled, or orchestrated by a foreign terrorist organization, ISIS or Al-Qaeda. And you saw what happened. In Las Vegas, yeah. you saw what happened in Texas. I mean, it's, it's a matter of not trivializing our, the threat, but not exaggerating it. So we live, we live scared lives, and we're, we're not going to live scared lives in this country. I don't think ISIS or Al-Qaeda, frankly, is the, is the real threat. The greatest threat the, the world faces right now is the possibility that through miscommunication, miscalculation, or misinformation, we end up in an escalatory cycle, and you end up with some military strike on the Korean Peninsula that leads to an escalation. I would have ruled out a year ago, had you asked me what are the chances of, a new, of, of the use of nuclear weapons, I would say virtually impossible. I've now recalibrated that to low, still low, but the fact that I'm arguing people are actually talking about the possibility of a war on the Korean Peninsula, even if it's low, it's not a good sign. Not a good sign. Aaron David Mill. Chuck, it was a pleasure. Thank you for coming in, sharing your insight. Glad to be back uh, close to Ann Arbor where I spent eight years. <laughs> Love to go back. Love to go back. And when Spotlight returns, we'll go down to the Cube and we'll talk to Megan Owens, Executive Director of Transportation Riders United. And welcome back to Spotlight. I've changed locations, obviously, down here, downtown at the Cube, our home here. And joining me is Megan Owens. She is executive director of Transportation Riders United, better known as True. Where are we a year later? Is it a dead issue now? Oh, no, no, definitely not a dead issue. The problems that, uh, that brought the Regional Transit Authority into creation and that uh, that we're facing in this region haven't gone away. There's still tens of thousands of people struggling to get access to jobs, to opportunities, to, to schools, to food, healthy foods. Uh, we're still, like the Amazon HQ2 mm -hmm. points out, missing out on a lot of opportunities. So there needs to be, uh, we absolutely need to address this problem. SMART and DDOT, the Q line are all taking very important steps to provide better transit, but well, not the idea. leap forward that we need from a regional perspective. Has, uh, has the queue line uh, right outside this window, has that helped your argument? Uh, if we had done this interview this time last year, it wouldn't have been there. It's hard to say. Uh, the queue line has been wonderful in many ways. Uh, it is, I wrote it down today and there's uh, a lot of people riding, uh, a lot of uh, transit riders, bus riders, a lot of people visiting from elsewhere in the region or elsewhere in the in the world. Uh, it is an attractive, easy way to get around, but it's not particularly fast. And I've heard from a lot of 
downtown business people, midtown uh, people who don't have a long time to wait, that they're a little frustrated that it's not moving faster, which in some ways gives us a good argument to explain why we do need things like the bus rapid transit that was in the plan that would make it uh, just as fast as driving to travel along Woodward, Gratiot, Michigan, our major corridors. So the queue line definitely shows how attractive and convenient transit can be, but also shows why uh, it's not going to be fast unless we design it specifically in a way to be a fast service. Uh, Megan, you all have put out a questionnaire that you really are encouraging the public to fill out, give you feedback. How do they get that? Sure, at DetroitTransit.org, which is our website, uh, we have the survey there. We're asking people, uh, what do you think about transit? What did you like about the transit plan? What, what were the, the flaws or the gaps? How could it be improved? Uh, what specific types of transit are most important? Because one of the concerns was, did the transit plan last year try to be all things to all people? and maybe it needs to prioritize. Does it need to be just about job access? Does it need to be about airport access? Does it need to be about connecting our communities? Does it need to be about rapid transit? Maybe trying to do everything all in one uh, was, was a little too much. So we want to really hear people's priorities. Again, DetroitTransit.org is our website or social media as well. Uh, when do you foresee we will come up for another vote uh, regional-wide to be able to say yay or nay? That's the big question. It could be as early as November of 2018, uh, and there's a lot of pressure to say these problems haven't gone away. We need to move quickly to make this happen. There's also some talk that maybe we need to wait until November of 2020 in order to give the region more time to think about, to talk about, to learn about transit. Uh, Thanks for coming in, updating us on what has happened in the last 365 some odd days. <laughs> Happy to. And we'll be back in a second to wrap things up in a couple words about something important going on in our community. We'll be right back. And finally today, a community reminder. Back in July, we interviewed Katie Brisson of the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan about their report with the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation on youth sports in our seven county region. The public is invited to learn more and participate in three December conversations about that report. For more information, go to our spotlight page on WXYZ.com. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. I'm Chuck Stokes, and I hope all of you have a happy Thanksgiving.